Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the sixth lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. In the fifth lecture, we have discussed Marx's views on modernity through the lenses of two important philosophical foundations of critical modernist paradigm in sociology, namely holism or totality and social movements. In this lecture, we are going to discuss Marx's views on modernity through the lenses of two more important uh, philosophical and political foundations of critical modernist paradigm in sociology, namely reflexivity and rationality. How have Marx's works contributed to the debates on modernity through reflexivity and rationality? Okay. Okay. How reflexivity and rationality are embedded, are deeply embedded in uh, the contributions of Marx. Okay. And then we will move on to Weber's views on modernity through the lenses of four uh, central philosophical and political foundations of modernity. Okay. So, far as reflexivity and rationality are concerned, okay, let us start with reflexivity. I mean humanity however, is not simply a self creating subject as we have uh, noticed in the context of social movements. It is also to a greater or lesser extent a self knowing subject. Okay. We have already seen uh, that Marx describes social consciousness as determined by social being or social existence. One way of thinking about this is uh, 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 as follows, I mean uh, our, our thinking and communication with one another is closely linked to our practical interaction with each other. Okay. We therefore, develop uh, at, an, at, at, at every level ways of thinking uh, which can be shown to be structured by the forms of this interaction. In other words, uh, by the kind of social labor processes we are involved in. Okay. At, a, at, a, at a more abstracted level, the theories that intellectuals articulate about the nature of society are shaped by this everyday experience, whether it is their own or as it often is someone else's. I mean, when we say human experience, we must take into consideration the our experiences vis-a-vis -vis the experiences of other people. Okay. Uh, uh, so, 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 for example, Marx argues that the constitutional lawyers uh, and economic theorists whose ideas formed so great a part of early democratic theories in Britain, France and America okay, are in effect working on the everyday experience of the small producers and traders who form the basis of these movements. There, uh, if you look at this, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, I mean their, their perception of individuals as originally 
isolated and coming together to trade is elaborated uh, into an ideology of individual rights okay uh, i mean including absolute rights over property and of a state whose role is to represent their interests and guarantee the legal context within which this production and trade can take place okay there is there is thus a movement from the everyday experience of a class to an ideology which articulates elaborates and formalizes this and which forms the basis of a revolt against an earlier order okay in this case the the the, the feudal order as the french revolution describes the ancient regime and the official ideology of a new social order okay when we, when we when we discuss ideology uh, especially uh, when we talk about ideology through the lens of marx okay marx has to be evaluated so far as ideologies are concerned marx must be examined both as a theoretician as well as an ideologue of the communist party as an ideologue of the communist party marx was in favor of the proletarian ideology which will i mean uh, the proletarians uh, the working classes will be the harbingers of proletarian revolution um, the poor the marginalized when they form class for itself they will be they will bring about that social and political revolution he was always in favor of proletarian ideology but 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 this is this is only a part of the story the story doesn't end here okay marx as an ideologue of the communist party was different from marx as a theoretician marx as a theoretician what are ideologies what are ideologies for marx as a theoretician for marx ideologies for marx as a theoretician ideologies are myths fantasies inverted images echoes of material life and so on. in quest of truth in quest of knowledge one must purge upon his or her ideology one must go beyond the narrow confinements of his or her own ideology that, that that's why uh, marx talked about the the ideology of the dominant classes uh, is the is the dominant ideology okay there is a platonic saying that uh, ideologies rule the world the 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 so so the theoretical ideas are not arbitrary that that uh, ideologies uh, at a, at a very generic level if i have to dwell upon i mean it's also not arbitrary it is very much practical okay nothing is de ideological nothing is apolitical even even today okay uh, because uh, these theoretical ideas these ideologies they are very much related to practice but they are partial no doubt about it Wh whichever ideology you talk about when i say this ideologies at a very generic level where i cannot prove i'll just say that no i believe in this ideology i do not believe in this ideology when belief comes into play with ideology without proof without justification then i think there is a problem then i think then then such ideologies uh, must be overcome must be overridden okay that's why uh, when marx said in quest of truth in quest of knowledge uh, one must go beyond the narrow confinements of her or his own ideologies i mean while dwelling upon uh, ideologies in general and the german ideology in particular when he said this i mean these theoretical ideas of course are not arbitrary they are very much uh, be because they are very much related to practice but but they are partial because uh, they represent the ideas of a class or we might say the ideas of a social and political movement 
social and political struggle. Okay. How can Marx justify his own theory in this context then? The first thing to say is that he is quite explicit that it is an ideology in this sense of an elaboration of the practical and everyday experience of a particular social group. However, Marx argues at various places that the working class age of a particular uh, I mean I mean working class is uh, I mean the working class is unique in history because it is a universal class in the sense that the final end of its class struggle will not be another form of uh, uh, class domination and division of labor, but will be an end to both the formation of a society consisting only of workers and in the sense that its domination and exploitation in present day society is total leading to a freedom from illusion which no previous class has said. The implication I mean the 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 the, uh, uh, the implication is that the theory is based on uh, based on the everyday experience of workers and the practical strategies of the workers movements can be said to operate from the viewpoint of the future universalistic society okay in other words when ideology is related to a group whose experience and experiences and and aims objectives can be said to be universal it can transcend the 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 limitations of being the theoretical expression of a partial perspective on society the practical the practical conclusion that marx draws from this is that he devotes himself okay uh, uh, to the uh, to uh, he 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 devotes himself to understanding the ways in which the working class is exploited and to involvement in its struggle against this exploitation. So, so uh, reflexivity for Marx is primarily a matter of awareness that theory is uh, ideological and of searching for a position from which these partial perspectives on society can coincide with the universal. He, he formulates he, he, he formulates Marx formulates um, um, such such proposition that 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 uh, uh, theory is uh, ideological and and uh, I mean I mean reflexivity is primarily a matter of awareness that theory is ideological and of searching for a position from these partial perspectives on society uh, which can coincide with the universal I mean Marx formulates this position in the manifesto of the communist party of 1848 by speaking of a portion of the bourgeois ideologists who have raised themselves to the level of comprehending theoretically the historical movement as a whole going over to the side of the working class. Okay. Then the, the reflexive position that, that, uh, that uh, Marx undertook that uh, uh, Marx propagated uh, uh, the reflexive position that Marx undertook uh, is very important to, to understand that any, any theory or any practice that we talk of uh, cannot be uh, de-ideological or apolitical. Whatever I say today, whatever you say today, okay, our at, at least at this, uh, at least maybe at the conscious level, maybe at the subconscious level, maybe at the unconscious level, we always try to try to put forward our viewpoints through certain ideological frameworks. Okay, in this sense. Okay, uh, and but 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 those ideologies may be belief ridden, maybe may not be belief ridden. In this sense, if I have to talk about it a little longer that uh, how the ideology of the dominant class is the dominant ideology because in a specific mode of production in, a, in, a, in any given society, okay, the, the, the kind of ideology that the dominant class uh, inherits okay, 
becomes the dominant ideology and that is how they try to the dominant classes the, the haves the, the exploited classes the bourgeois they try to dominate uh, the poor the, the, the marginalized sections of the society. Okay. In this sense Marx's reflexive position okay, is, is primarily a matter of more awareness, more organization of being more radical okay, and, and nothing is ideology free, nothing is neutral, okay. I mean nothing is theory free, everything is theory laden. Okay. If you, if you uh, uh, look at Karl Popper's work on the logic of scientific discovery, you will find that uh, he argues that whatever we say, all I mean all rationalist uh, uh, philosophers of science, they also argue that whatever we say, whatever we do, okay, they are not theory free, rather they are theory laden. They are not ideology free, they are ideology laden. Okay. They are not value neutral, they are value laden. Okay which the inductivists, positivists, they, they oppose, they say that no, no, uh, uh, it is not, uh, uh, we do not start with theory, we always start with observation and so on, but there are, there are debates, there are conflicting perspectives. If you want to have, have uh, better, better uh, grasping of these debates, you can refer to uh, 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 the lectures that I delivered uh, in the last semester on science, technology and society under this, um, under the same program, I mean massive open online uh, uh, course uh, on science, technology and society uh, initiated by MHRD of the government of India. Okay. Then what about rationality? The term itself is not massively used in, 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 in Marx's works, but the concept appears often enough in a number of contexts. The first is in the uh, figure of thought that the rational is the real. What is real? For Marx, anything irrational is not real, only the rational is real. In other words, that a, that a rational understanding is an understanding of reality which is valid because it starts with, starts from valid premises. Okay. In this sense, Marx treats his replacement of accounts of human history in terms of the development of philosophy, art, religion and so on by accounts in terms of the development of social production as a move towards rational understanding, reasoning capacity. And there is a suggestion that by choosing to theorize from the position of the universal working class. Okay, Marx is guaranteeing a correspondence between the ideological and the rational, between socially determined thinking and a valid understanding of reality. Then, then Marx as a theoretician gets foregrounded. Okay, that that if if I have to say that uh, what is uh, um, an ideology? You know, because it is a socially determined thinking. Then how? Then what is rationality? You no, know, it is a valid understanding of reality. That is why the, for, for Marx, the rational is the real, uh, reality is not uh, 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 represented by um, anything irrational. Okay. Uh, I mean a second form is in terms of what we might call capitalist rationality. What is that capitalist rationality? That the argument that a particular mode of production involves the imposition of a particular logic. For example, a logic of the exchange of commodities. On all social interaction, everything becomes a commodity to be bought and sold on the market. Everything is a commodity in capitalism. Even I deliver lectures, it is also a commodity in capitalism. If, if my students are listening to my lectures, that, are, that has also become a com part of commodity. Everything, I mean, I mean uh, gender is a commodity, I mean sex is a commodity, 
um, uh, caste is a commodity, race is a commodity, everything has turned out to be a commodity in capitalism. My whole, my, my, I mean my body is a commodity, my labor is a commodity. Okay? That is why commodification of labor, commodification of an individual. Okay? That is why, that is why uh, when I say capitalist rationality, I tend to argue that that a particular that it refers to a particular mode of production which involves the imposition of a particular logic. And this this log this, this logic also is not by fluke, it is not spontaneous, it is also so, very much regulated by the powers that be. For example, the logic of the exchange of commodities on all social interaction, so that everything becomes a commodity to be bought and sold in the market. Another feature of this capitalist rationality is the accumulation of capital. Okay? In other words, of economic power in ever fewer hands. Okay. Uh, that that uh, when I say uh, 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 accumulation of capital uh, in ever fewer hands. Okay. Lastly, there is a suggestion that history has a rational potential. In other words, that the actual interaction of human beings in social production can be understood, brought to serve their own needs and transformed into a situation of mutual communication and interactive self-realization. This involves suggesting both a movement towards a form of production which does not involve domination, subjugation and exploitation of one human being by another and a movement to form uh, uh, and, and, and a movement to form uh, to a, to a f, uh, and, uh, and the movement to a form of ideological thinking which is universal and therefore represents a valid understanding of reality. Uh, this, this idea of rationality uh, in other words complex one okay, uh, which can refer either to modes of understanding or to an assumption that the way the world works or can work is related to the way we think or can think. This, this, this last assumption can be defended in terms of the statement that the social world is a human creation. The link between the way we act and the way we think means that the real is ultimately the rational. Okay? Now, now, now we have, we have got into uh, I mean we have we have discussed a few things I mean I mean Marx's views on modernity mm. through the lenses of reflexivity and rationality. Okay? In the last lecture we discussed Marx's views on modernity through the lenses of holism or totality and social movements. Okay? Now let us let us summarize what we have discussed so far as Marx's views on modernity are concerned or, or rather uh, uh, not I am not going to give you a gist of this rather uh, I am I'm going to uh, uh, provide um, you with uh, a, a summary of Marx as a theorist of modernity. Okay. In the in the uh, uh, if you look at uh, when when uh, Marx was deeply involved in uh, writing about social transformation, I mean, eighteen forties, uh, uh, late thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, and early part of eighteen hundred and eighties, Marx developed the mature version of his philosophical, social, and economic theory. It may be about class, it may be about class struggle, it may be about uh, social revolution, political revolution, movements, uh, modernity, uh, mechanization and so on. When we think of such theories, we imagine uh, 
a scholar poring for hours over tombs in the British Museum, but usually Marx's theoretical pursuits had to be crammed in beside far more time consuming activities. I mean politics, Germany, uh, I mean uh, uh, politics, journalism, uh, wars, evading creditors and the serious uh, or fatal illnesses that plagued his children and his wife and after the onset of his skin disease in 1863, Marx himself. All too often, uh, Marx's theoretical labors were interrupted for months at a time or reserved for odd hours late at night. Even without these detours, Marx always tended to work slowly and revise constantly. He had difficulty getting the final version of his thoughts down on paper. So, it is no surprise that he never developed the critics of society and intellectual disciplines first planned in 1845. The results of his theoretical deliberations are, 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 I mean, are, are interesting to interpret, uh, albeit for opposing reasons in different branches of knowledge. Marx's writings after 1850 on philosophy, society and history were fragmented. Snippets of journalism or suggestions for, from correspondence, relevant passages in political polemics or economic treatises. Despite occasionally mentioned plans, he never produced an extensive theoretical work, uh, which, which his opponents claim, which has led commentators and interpreters to focus their attention on his 1840s manuscripts, incomplete but at least substantial. By contrast, the problem with the writings on economics is that uh, there was too much. Two books were published in Marx's lifetime on the critic of political economy of 1849 and Capital Volume 1 of 1867. Capital Volume 1 in fact, um, as anyone has ever picked, up, picked it up knows is lengthy and dense. Besides, the material that appeared in print, Marx left behind an enormous array of manuscripts on economics that Engels sorted through and edited into two volumes. Uh, I mean uh, volumes 2 and uh, 3 of capital. I mean, I mean further manuscripts on the history of political economy were later published as theories of surplus value. But reducing the mass of handwritten manuscripts even to three book, uh, three thick books meant leaving out a large volume of unpublished writings. To say nothing of Marx's extensive notes on economics and the many discussions of economic questions in his correspondence. When I, when I have to look at Marx's reflections on, on, on modernity, uh, I mean uh, uh, starting, from, uh, 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 starting from the emergence of positivistic school of thought, I mean supremacy of sciences over non-sciences, positivism of course initially appeared at the beginning of the 19th century, but it quickly advanced to a leading status in European intellectual and cultural life only after. 1850. Positivists and many contemporaries who did not use that term saw human knowledge emerging from empirical perception of the world and, and such thinking also influenced Marx okay? and that empirical perception of the world. Unlike the 18th century empiricists whose ideas were heavily criticized by Kant and Hegel, positivists understood empirical knowledge as a result of scientific procedures. I mean experiment, organized data gathering and mathematical analysis rather than simple sense perception. At first, the physical sciences provided the model for positivist epistemology, okay? uh, I mean in the form of Newton's works, uh, Principium. Uh, but after Darwin's on the origin of species appeared in 1859, evolutionary biology became a steadily more important template for the acquisition of knowledge. Contemporaries took these scientific models and applied them to every imaginable intellectual discipline from anthropology and sociology to literary criticism perceptions of human history were recast in terms of evolutionary stages of the advance of science. Okay. This, this, this such, such development in, in the physical sciences initially, but especially in the biological sciences through Darwin's works. Uh, such development represented a particular problem for Marx. Through, through Hegelian scholarship, uh, through, uh, through the scholarship of uh, uh, Feuerbach and the rise of positivism by the 1850s and 1860s, 
was producing a very different form of uh, 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 a political scenario, social system and so on. And Marx along with uh, who along with Engels followed scientific developments uh, closely was very much aware of this such such intellectual uh, transformation. For, for Marx's one time uh, uh, comrades, the young Hegelians, the new intellectual uh, uh, trends were partially uh, were, were painfully apparent. Marx had little sympathy with their complaints when Bruno Boy visited Marx in London at the end of 1855. He observed as Marx wrote with amusement to Engels that in Germany horrible indeed uh, nothing more is purchased and read than miserable compilations from the field of the natural sciences. A couple of years later, Arnold Ryu uh, announced that he was planning a new uh, version of the German yearbooks. According to Marx, its main task is to be a struggle against materialism in industry and the natural sciences also against competitive linguistics which is sprouting up everywhere in sort against everything for which exact knowledge is necessary. Okay? These, these, these remarks, these such, these such remarks made by Marx sound distinctly positivist. The attitudes of, a, of, of Marx abandoning his own previous allegiance to Hegelian thought for a new worldview based on the empirical findings of the sciences. This is what makes Marx a, a, a modernist one. In his public pronouncements after 1850, Marx sounded a distinctly positivist one. If we juxtapose his description of the impoverishment of the working class in the manifesto of the communist party of 1848 with a similar examination uh, uh, in 1866, 67, uh, I mean 1866, if I have, uh, yeah, 1866 mm. uh, in, the, in the inaugural address to uh, uh, um, uh, no, 1864, 1864, yeah, 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 he, 1864, uh, 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 when he, when he uh, uh, addressed, uh, I mean delivered the inaugural address to the uh, International Working Men's Association, we can clearly see the increasing positivism. Okay? The, the manifesto of the Communist Party of 1848 described a dialectical process in which labor is transformed into its opposite capital and the workers labor impoverishes them as it is externalized in the capital it creates. I mean, I mean many, many, many still influential older works of scholarship often written about considering the, the Hegelian inflected texts of the 1840s simply treat. Uh, mm. uh, Marx as a positivist, but when he goes beyond positivism, it is also interesting to see. But, but looking more closely at his responses to developments in the natural and physical sciences after 1850, a more complex picture emerges in which he both accepted and crit criticized new scientific advances. That is why from the very beginning I said Marx uh, and Engels, they did not accept modernity. Uh, absolutely, they also did not reject modernity absolutely. Okay? That is why, uh, I mean Marx both accepted and criticized new scientific advances especially after 1850s. He accommodated his philosophical presuppositions to them, but also had, uh, but also held fast to his philosophical basics which articulate, while articulating them in a form more acceptable to a positivist era. One of Marx's first encounters with science after 1850 came from a close friend and political associate Roland Daniels. In 1851, before the, the uh, uh, Cologne uh, physician was arrested, Mar uh, uh, he, uh, I mean, uh, arrested and indicted uh, in the uh, Cologne communist trial, he wrote to Marx about a theoretical work he was preparing. Okay, that is microcosm draft of a physiological anthropology. Daniels's starting point was the same as Marx's had been in, in the 1840s. 
far back's notion of sensuous humanity as the basis of knowledge and historical uh, 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 development. But for Daniels, the sensuous human being of far back is and remains. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean um, that 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 sensuous human being. Uh, of far back's theories was a physiological human being, the human organism is and remains my major. History and society were, were physiological, the reflex responses of human organisms to stimuli from their environment. Okay? This is important. Okay? Then, then following, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, following in uh, uh, far back's footsteps, Daniels wanted to create a physiological uh, philosophy, a scientific materialist and practical uh, atheism uh, sharply differing from the philosophical and ideal, uh, idealist atheism of the young Hegelians. And, and these, these interactions also have, have these interactions, these exchanges of ideas, these uh, conversations, communications have also shaped Marx's writings to a great extent. Okay. Daniels uh, um, uh, uh, understood socialism in physiological terms. Suppose interest is a matter of indifference to me, but not the purity of my food, interest on loans. Okay. A socialist society would aim to provide, uh, would aim to improve scientifically determined public and individual health to their maximum extent. Daniel suggested that socialist demands could be summed up in one sentence production according to strict scientific criteria solely with regard to uh, with regard for the human organism. Okay. Marx apparently told Daniels that his whole approach was sometimes too mechanical to anatomical that he was unable to integrate human consciousness into the into his explanation of history or to explain how society if constituted by physiological um, uh, laws could ever be changed. Marx even asserted that he found Bruno Bohr more uh, sophisticated, more, more analytical, more articulative than, than far back, perhaps surprising even far back's materialism and Bohr's ideology. But this attitude certainly fit with, uh, with a rejection of positivism. Far back's own later writings moved in a positivist direction, criticizing Hegel for stating that truth has to be found in a dialectical historical process rather than simply being available to uh, us in through perceptions. Marx showed considerable interest in Daniels's ideas. He filled Daniels's letters with underlinings and marginal emphasis, uh, but his rejection of explanations of human history and society of the foundations of philosophy and the arguments in favor of socialism in terms of scientific physiology suggest a skeptical attitude towards positivism. Perhaps, perhaps he needed something more convincing than his, uh, than, than uh, perhaps Marx uh, required something more convincing than Daniels's uh, physiological philosophy to move him. A logical place to look for such an impetus would be the greatest intellectual event of, uh, of uh, the positivist era, uh, positivist age and the most significant scientific event uh, of the entire 19th century. And, 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 and when Darwin published his, uh, uh, I mean published uh, on the origin of species, uh, I mean this, this, this publication of, the publication of on the origin of species not only revolutionized science, it evolved emulation and repulsion in virtually all aspects of European cultural and, and intellectual life. As everyone knows or thinks they know, Marx offered to dedicate capital to Darwin, Darwin and repeatedly claimed that Darwin's findings on nature confirmed his own on human society. Yet while Marx accepted the scientific validity of Darwin's theories and endorsed them in positivist fashion for their support of atheism and ideas of progress, he also advanced a Hegelian criticism of Darwin's concepts and showed skepticism about their application to the study of human history and society. Okay. This, is, this is interesting, I mean this is, uh, uh, this is intellectually stimulating, thought provoking. Okay. How 
changes in the biological phenomena can be translated into changes in our social, economic and political phenomena. Okay. Marx's introduction to Darwin came from Engels, who had acquired a copy of On the Origin of Species within two weeks of its publication in November 1859. He read rapidly and enthusiastically and reported to his reported uh, uh, to reported to Marx that the book was just terrific. Up to now, there has never been such a wonderful attempt uh, made to uh, prove historical development in nature, at least not with such success. It took Marx a year to follow Engels' recommendation and actually read the book himself, which he did while nursing his wife through her bout with uh, smallpox. Although uh, developed in a crude English way, this is the book that contains the basis for our views in natural history, he told Engels. In January 1861, he wrote uh, uh, Ferdinand uh, Lasser that Darwin's writing is very important and suits me as the basis in natural history for the historical cluster. Once awakened, Marx's interest in Darwin's uh, ideas continued for years. He repeatedly discussed evolutionary theory with his friends and associates in London, attended lectures and studied the writings of Darwin's chief popularizer. Uh, Huxley and uh, I mean Thomas Hen Henry Huxley uh, and, and uh, avidly uh, read authors who claimed to have developed improved versions of the idea of natural selection. From this, it would be easy to conclude that Darwin's writings had converted Marx to the positivist idea of natural science as the basis for knowledge. But there was a more skeptical side to Marx's uh, attitude to, uh, about the great biologist after reading on the origin of species he wrote to Engels in June 1862 that with Darwin's work which I have looked at again it amuses me that he says he is also applying the Malthusian theory of to plants and animals as if the whole point with uh, Malthus were not that his theory is not applied to plants and animals but to humans with geometric progression in contrast to plants and animals. It is remarkable how Darwin recognizes among beasts and plants his English society with its division of labor competition, uh, opening of uh, new markets, inventions and Malthusian struggle for existence. It is reminiscent of Hegel in the phenomenology where uh, bourgeois society appears as the spiritual animal kingdom while in Darwin the animal kingdom appears as. Okay. I mean, I mean Marx. I mean, I mean this, this uh, if I have to summarize the, the whole, whole, whole discourse on, on how uh, Marx's works have contributed or Marx's reflections on other wo others works have contributed to the debates on modernity. I mean this, this such, such, such reflection of Darwin's work was the very opposite of positivism. In, in which the natural sciences provided a model for the understanding of the world. Instead, it took the Hegelian position that philosophy or in Marx's version a philosophically inflected political economy could evaluate and criticize the conceptual basis of other branches of knowledge including the sciences. As Marx considered the ma matter further, he became more skeptical about claims that Darwin's theories provided a guide to economy and society. Okay. Marx came to see Darwinism as part of a positivist trend that was undermining the position of Hegelian ideas. Okay. In a, in a, in a well-known uh, afterword to the second edition of Capital Volume 1, he denounced contemporary uh, German thinkers who saw Hegel as a dead dog and insisted on the validity of his dialectical methods which he had applied in his critique of political economy. Marx left. Marx left those German thinkers so critical of Hegel anonymous in print, but in a letter to Engels he suggested that the problem began with Farback, who has a lot in his conscience in that respect. Okay. If, if, I mean, if this were Marx's view regarding Darwinians, uh, why would he offer to dedicate uh, capital to Darwin? The answer is quite simple. The story that Marx tried to dedicate capital to Darwin is a myth that, uh, that has been uh, repeatedly refuted, but seems virtually ineradicable. Okay. 
I mean, I mean, these are a few more of the course things uh, um, about uh, about whether he he actually uh, dedicated it or uh, dedicated the first volume of Capital to Darwin or not. And uh, um, there is also evidence that Darwin uh, uh, rejected that uh, uh, that dedication. Uh, uh, but but but. Uh, but we have also evidences contrary to this position, uh, contrary to such uh, uh, such opinions. Uh, op uh, I mean, such happenings. Uh, but what we have learnt now in this lecture, broadly, broadly, we have discussed in these these two lectures. I mean, in the fifth lecture and today's lecture in the sixth one what we have discussed? We have discussed Marx's views on modernity through the through the four central pillars of modernity namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. We have also discussed the contradictory views which have been posed by two important philosophical uh, schools. Uh, of two important schools of thought namely materialism as well as idealism and how both Marx and Engels could hold aloft the banner of materialism while dwelling upon not only a self creating subject, but also self knowing subject. When I say self creating subject, I mean he was they were trying to dwell upon uh, social movements and when I said uh, self knowing subject, I refer to both reflexivity as well as rationality. Okay. This is very important. Then if I when we look at look at this okay, that is why uh, 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 when we see this kind of this kind of um, uh, interpretation uh, or, or, or reflections uh, on modernity by Marx, it is equally important to, to look at one of his contemporaries who also hails from Germany and he is Max Weber. But before, before going into in the seventh lecture in the, in the lecture to follow, we are going to discuss uh, uh, Max Weber, uh, uh, Max Weber's interpretation of modernity, uh, uh, and and uh, again again through the lenses of lenses of uh, uh, those four pillars of critical modernist paradigm in sociology, namely holism or totality, uh, reflexivity, rationality, and social movements. Okay, and then we'll we'll move on to. Uh, to uh, ultra modernism, the structuralist case. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean the the uh, the works of uh, uh, Levi Strauss and and Louis Althusser. Okay, but 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 for the time being, for the time being, please uh, let us see what we have covered from the very beginning before we move on to. Max Weber. Okay. We started with thematic preliminaries. Okay. We started with thematic preliminaries, then we have uh, uh, within th thematic preliminaries, we discussed critical modernism or critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Okay. Uh, then the method that we are, we are we have been using to understand uh, uh, different deliberations on modernity. Okay, that is the sociological imagination by C. Wright Mills, and then uh, we discussed how we apply concepts. I mean, what what kind of good working relationship with theory? Uh, the nature of sociological theory we have discussed. Ontology we have discussed. We have discussed uh, uh, the the modernist paradigm in sociology. I mean, all these four central pillars of modernity, namely holism or totality. Uh, uh, reflexivity, uh, rationality, and social movements. Uh, then we have discussed the ambiguity of rationality and control. 
governance versus emancipation and the, the significance of instrumental nationality vis-a-vis uh, um, uh, -vis, uh, substantive rationality. Then in, then in the second section, I mean sociology classic statements about sociological modernism, we have discussed the, uh, the works of uh, Marx till now. Uh, in Marx uh, um, uh, on modernity, we have uh, uh, discussed how Marx's ideas about modernity were shaped by three intellectual and political uh, trajectories, namely German philosophy, British economy and French politics. And Marx's empirical starting point for thinking about the new society is largely a projection of each of these developments in the future. Okay, and 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 uh, for Marx, I mean, uh, I mean, we have discussed Marx's views about modernity through the lenses of uh, uh, holism or totality, then social movements, then reflexivity and rationality, and in the in the in the next lecture in the seventh lecture we are we are going to discuss uh, max weber's interpretations of modernity i mean in terms of rationality and modernity in terms of social movements in terms of uh, 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 reflexivity uh, uh, um, mm. and of course in terms of holism or totality of, and we will find out whether Marx's views on modernity are a holist one or not in contradistinction with Weber's views on modernity are a holist one or not. Okay? Thank you.